profit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing you proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating through our eternity to this present day. In this school, we show proof. This school is established as the result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. In this school, we show proof of the true correct. In this school, we use the true correct and original name and title of the Father. The word or son and the holy spirit are as they are contained in the original hebrew text the true name of the heavenly father is yahweh this has been improperly substituted by lord the true title of the word or son is elohim this has been improperly substituted by god and the true name of the holy spirit manifest in or out of a physical body is yahshua the messiah this has been erroneously substituted by jesus christ now, Lord and God are titles, not names. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, it is a divine title, meaning it is the title our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in any good encyclopedia or dictionary will prove to you that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters in their alphabet capable of producing the sound that is made by this letter J. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Um, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state we have him symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He really chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud is no particular or descriptive shape and form. We've drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show to you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. And in like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. And Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. A superincorporeal being that's having the shape and... This is the word or son. I'm oh, sorry. This is the word or son. A superincorporeal being that's having a shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Yahweh later manifests. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Yahweh later manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given on, given on a man whereby we can be saved. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. In this school, we also show proof of... Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel up out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern and vision. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. And these three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, in this school we show proof that absolutely everything in the universe abides, is made and abides by this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes it. The ten primary constitutional aims and objectives of this of this institute are as follows. First, is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in the in the after the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or the so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, is to extra, extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, is to learn, know, under, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, 
is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which is once delivered to the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, and that there is no other name given among men whereby we can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. At this time, we will have we will have class dedicated in prayer by Kim Galicchio from Artport class. And our scripture lesson will be Exodus, the 20th chapter. That could be read by Dr. Patrice Williams. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. Let's all bow our hearts and minds to our Heavenly Father. Yahshua, we ask that you take the cares of the world and set them outside the door for this two hours that we're able to assemble. We thank you for the wonderful blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you for translating us into your kingdom and showing us the mysteries and divine revelations that the world just has no idea the gems that are with preached behind the doors of these classes. Yahshua, please continue to knock on our door and sup with us make us see and understand and believe really believe that you did all of these things and took this old covenant out of the way so that your holy spirit can dwell within us and so that we can be one with you we love you father in your son's name let us all say hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. i'll be reading the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus using the holy name version of the word. And Elohim spake all these words saying, I am Yahweh, thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no Elohim before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for i yahweh thy elohim am a jealous elohim visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take away the name of Yahweh thy Elohim to bring it to naught, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that taketh away his name to bring it to naught. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherewith Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which Yahweh thy Elohim giveth thee. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, 
speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not Elohim speak with us lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, fear not, for Elohim is come to prove you and that his fear may be for be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where Elohim was. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make idols, not make with me idols of silver, neither shall ye make unto you images of gold, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places where I record my name. I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. That was the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, our first speaker this morning will be Dr. Patty Deslin. Uh, hi, y'all. Can you hear me? We can. Sure, thank you. Good morning. Thanks, Mary. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, had a lot of uh, that was every time you get to you read a a chapter, even though you heard it before, it it you know really comes to pass in your mind um, so much. And even though the Ten Commandments are not physical now. Um, and it would, they were all fulfilled by Yahshua, uh, the spiritualness of them uh, comes comes through to you on what people are doing now. You know, um, like what right, chapter well, 20 on 4, uh, thou shalt not make any the graven idol or any likeness, or that is the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath. But well, what I'm seeing is more and more I'm seeing people wearing crosses made of silver and gold. Um, now, I'm not sure on this, but as I've been told, uh, that's like sort of killing Yahshua over again. You're, you're uh, celebrating uh, that death, but they're not understanding what that death meant. You know, why, why it was done. And um, so you're just seeing that there, and you, I, I see people, and I say, you understand that cross? You know, I want to say that. Um, but then again, my knowledge is not as well, and I might not speak it correctly. But that, that was bothering me this week. I was seeing a lot of crosses on people. Uh, I guess maybe they're afraid, and they're thinking that um, this, is, this is going to save them. Um, but it's not. Um, let's see. I know there was an, another one there at, that popped up on me here. Let's see. I should have circled it. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, I guess it's not coming to me. Yeah, but all that even, you know, about adultery, um, murder, you know, stealing. Uh, fault with with both a witness against thy neighbor. Now I'm just um, assuming that means you know don't go taking their things um, and and to treat them well uh, and sharing the gospel with them and that. But um, all these things, uh, well, they're physical, but still in our our mind our spiritual mind we know not to commit adultery and not to steal uh and things like that but um yeah that's what came through but i, I wanted to share something with you today uh that i thought i picked up a um uh, a little quote i had to change 
and put the correct name in. Um, but I thought that this was cool. Um, it's titled Only Yahweh. Only Yahweh can turn a mess into a message. Hmm. Only Yahweh can turn a test into a testimony. And only Yahweh can turn a trial into a triumph. And only Yahweh can turn a victim into a victory. I just thought that was kind of cool. And I wanted to share that um, uh, with you all. Uh, okay, let's see what else we got here, guys. Do Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Ye shall not make with me idols of silver, nor shall ye make unto you images of gold. That's like all the, um, uh, the Saint, what is it, Saint Patrick? Not Patrick. Uh, yeah, saint. Oh, hello? Oh. Okay. Oh. You're good. Keep going. Oh, am I good? Okay. I was just, got, didn't know what was going on. But, you know, people wearing, um, the St. Christopher, that's the big one. I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry, Nick. But um, hanging it on your... If you could mute us, that would be great. I don't want in your back. You're in the tent alone, you're on me. Are we there, guys? Hello? Go ahead. You, there you go, Graham. We can hear you. Oh, okay. What was going on? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, you know, seeing that, I mean, Yahweh knew then that they were, you know, going to be doing stuff like that. And they're still doing it now. Uh, but we have to understand that this was before. We're not doing it now. We need to know the truth and understand everything in a spiritual way but um all right guys um thank you so much for allowing me to speak a little bit uh i hand it over to another speaker because i'm very very much wanting to hear some um good words here today uh, i love you all peace in yashua hallelujah 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 thank you for your testimony dr petty deslin and our next speaker this morning will be me, Ooh. Sam Lattimore from Perrysburg, New York, the moderator. You can put the camera on if you wish. It working on it. Give me one second here. Sorry. All right. I don't know why since I got to speak on the floor. I'm trying to think there's there's been a couple of things I've had my mind on lately and I'm trying to think of a good way to kind of put it across I guess I'm gonna go back to a testimony those I did previously but it was recently brought back to my mind and I've gotten to work on a little bit more as of late blue, red, purple, black doesn't work. blue red purple black doesn't work all right let's start with blue I'm like include it so You'll see in this school, I make a couple bold statements right in the moderation. And one that's really easy to try, especially against new people and like young people, is um, everything in the universe abides by this threefold tabernacle pattern. Your most holy place, your holy place, and your court roundabout. And I remember when I was a kid, one thing my parents would always do, and this is a very fond memory of mine, is they'd say, Go outside, walk around for a little while, and come back to me and tell me something that doesn't come through. Yeah. And that was always just like, so we go out and we see like, um, oh, this tree, well, that doesn't come in threes. And they point out, and we don't really have the green chart, but if you have an opportunity, I think Lionel might be able to show it on screen for you if you want. Um, we have a green chart that shows a lot of this stuff and how it kind of breaks down in threes. Hang on, I, hang on a second. You guys see that? See everything all right? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, one of my personal favorite things 
to break down is the atom diagram. And that's, you have your dense nucleus here, right in the middle. That is your protons and your neutrons. So this is your most holy place and your holy place. I don't quite remember which is the most holy place in the holy place. I want to say the proton was the most holy place and neutron was holy, but don't quote me on that. But this is just to break it down a little further. And then you have your core roundabout, and this looks like an egg. Yeah. And this is your principal energy level that kind of has like those electrons there. So you have your protons in here, which are positive. And then you have your neutrons, which have zero charge. And that's kind of how you show that. And then have your electrons. And those are the three principal parts of it. That's the three but one. But as with everything else in this school, it breaks down a lot more fine than that. And the reason this has been on my mind is we just went over it in physics again. We kind of did this in chemistry, but it was re brought back to my attention. So, whenever you have this atom, it breaks down like you have an atomic number. This is your helium atom. So, I'm going to draw the box up here. You have H, E, and then these are your mass. So, you have like four things in the center. So, that's your mass unit. It's a four, and then two protons. Two is your atomic number, and that breaks down charges and whatnot for the electrons. Well, what's really cool about this is down here below that, I didn't write this quite small enough for you. Big enough. You're big enough. Yeah. So down here in the bottom of this helium thing, I'm just going to redraw this. So you have H, E, two, four. To and that breaks down your electron configurations in the bottom. And what that means is it's which of these rings you see the electrons on. And the bigger the atom, the more these rings you have. So for helium, it's rather simple. It has, I believe it's just two, because helium has very, very few electrons. So it's like you just have these two electrons hanging out right here. And those are your valence electrons. That's what kind of you lose and you bond with. But what's particularly cool about that is through history, they came up with a whole bunch of different models for the atom. And the current accepted model for the atom is it starts off the same. You have this dense nucleus here with all your stuff in the middle. And then instead of those rings that go around for the electrons, you have like this big circle here. You have all those rings in there but they don't really know exactly where the rest of those rings are. So what they do is they find areas of probability for where those electrons would be. It's so like you get a dot here, dot there, they just kind of scatter about and then you get a couple real close to each other here and like up in here and a few way out and around. And it'd take a long time for me to do this to the scale of a diagram. But um, eventually you keep going and you're going and going and it looks a lot like a cloud. And it was actually taught to me, that's what we called it in chemistry, is we actually called it the cloud diagram. Mm -hmm. um, I have my physics notes with me right now, so I can tell you the actual name of it. But um, it's like a super, super cool thing. When you look online, there's like thousands and thousands of these dots there. And it's like, okay, so this is, there's probably an electron here, but then there could be one here. And it really does, it looks like a cloud. So it's like everything in this universe exists within the cloud. Yeah. And that's even on like the atomic level. So this is some of the smallest particles we have. Mm. And then even those small particles break down further. Um Quarks. I I'm gonna need to get my physics note here in a minute just so I can not correct myself or not mistake anything. But they break down further into two primary forms. There's quarks and then one other thing. But the quarks break down in nine different parts. Of course. So there's nine different quarks that make up these protons and neutrons and a couple other forms of matter. And then there's the electrons and photons, which are made by a different thing. Um, I, I really feel bad about not having these names. I wasn't really prepared for this today. But that's all like, and then, in addition to this stuff, so they have, um, I keep erasing the neutron here. That's not as important for this next diagram. So if you have these PLs still, 
And then this is one of my favorite things here. Whenever scientists look at really far away stars, they there's a relatively simple way that they find out what those stars are comprised of. So you have your electrons here. And then when they gain energy, which might I add, they gain energy in the form of a photon or light. So when they gain energy, they jump up a level. But when they lose that energy, they jump back down. And that energy is emitted in the form of a photon. And each individual atom has a different color of light that it'll emit whenever these um, electrons jump back down. And it's like, so if they jump down from here to here, they lose substantially less but they all emit that energy in the form of light. So that's where most of your light comes from is actually whenever these electrons jump down from these levels, you get different color light. So um, I think the easiest one is hydrogen. Hydrogen just has one proton and one neutron right in the nucleus and then one electron. And that one electron jumps up one PL and down one PL, that simple. It's as simple as simple can be, and that emits the blue light. And that's one of the most common gases in all of the universe. And then another thing they taught us in chemistry that's related to this is on that outside ring, I, I need to stop erasing this. I keep having to redraw. So on this outside ring, all the electrons out here are what's known as your valence electrons. And I your briefly what? mentioned earlier, those are your bonding electrons. Okay. So I'm going to draw a carbon atom because that's the easiest one to explain this with, because there's actually a whole, it's organic chemistry is based entirely around this carbon atom, because yeah. it does a lot in the natural world. As you can imagine, all life that we know of is carbon based. Mm -hmm. So you have carbon, atomic number six, mass 12.0013. That's not as important for right now. I'll get to that in a second. And then your electron configuration has six electrons, but its configuration is two, four. So it has these four electrons out here. So whenever this carbon atom bonds with other atoms, it'll either lose these electrons or gain more electrons. And the goal is whenever it bonds, they want to have eight of those valence electrons combined. Mm -hmm. And you can have any combination of atoms. You can have two to four carbon atoms all bonded together and they'll share these electrons so they can get eight, and that's the octet rule. And that states no atom is truly stable until it has these eight electrons mm -hmm. in, its, um, uh, in its valence PDL, its last PL. And on, like, the, uh, on the periodic table of elements, all the way on the right, you have row 18. Those are your, what are those then? What's, what's your noble gases. noble gases. The noble gases already have eight of those valence electrons. So those are the most stable things in the universe. They have those eight electrons. They're noble. And everything <laughs> is going to bond until it gets those eight, and that's what's going to make it stable, which is why you don't see many things like just pure carbon in the universe. But what I find really, really cool about organic chemistry is wherever you form these bonds, you'll have your carbon atom, and it likes to be right in the center of all of these bonds. Mm -hmm. And that's like the first thing they taught us is whenever you have a carbon atom, you're going to start, you have four hydrogen, which is six, four H, and one carbon. And right, a little bit. So it's, um, sorry, H, four, C. That's four hydrogen atoms and one carbon. You start right with the carbon right in the middle, that's six, and then you have the hydrogen coming off in either direction. And that's going to be the same no matter what you use. That carbon's always going to put itself right in the middle. It wants to be at the forefront in the attention, yeah. the most important thing. And as I can imagine you've heard before, there's that principle of carbon and the devil. Mm -hmm. Six flesh. It's, it's that six, that flesh, the six, six, six. Um. And the, I will be like the most high. So that is, as far as science is concerned, one of the most important elements that we know of to date because it makes up absolutely everything. But then what I mentioned earlier, whenever I showed you, you had this carbon atom here. And I said it's like 12.0013 or something, the mass. That's 
the collective mass or the average mass for carbon in all of its ions. And one ion of carbon is carbon 14. Carbon 14. And what that means is that this carbon atom here has your regular six protons, but it has eight neutrons. So that's not stable for this carbon atom. So it wants to lose those neutrons. And whenever it loses those neutrons, that, that's the radioactive process of carbon-14 is losing those neutrons in the form of an alpha particle, which is a very big, bulky particle when we're talking about radiation. It's actually the largest particle. But anyways, so this breaks down with the half-life of roughly 5,700, let me write that larger, 5,715 years is the half-life of carbon-14. So what that means is after that period of time, let's say you had 100 of these carbon-14 atoms, you're going to lose half of those in that period of time. So after 5,715 years, they say give or take about 300 mm. for this process. You're going to lose 50 of those atoms, so on and so forth. So after another period of this time, you're going to lose half of those that you had. So it's like it goes from 50 to 25 of those atoms, so on and so forth. But it's in a constant state of decay. Yeah. And that's this carbon atom makes up the whole natural world. So it's this this carbon 14 is constantly breaking down and decaying. Mm -hmm. Much like these fleshy physical human bodies. I mean, we do, we stink. I like I, I run my hand through my hair and you'll see like dandruff float off. Mm -hmm. And I'll brush my hair and hair's falling out. And I got to like scrub myself and get the stench off me and get mm. all this dirty, dead, dying skin cells off me. And we're in a constant state of decay. Yep. And it was, it was never meant to last. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the point here is even the natural world as we know it is in that constant state of decay. Nothing here is permanent mm -hmm. and it's all going to break down. And what's important about this number is that's awful close to your 6,000. So that's one thing I like to relate to this. We had, if you combine the anti... The, the years are up there too. The antediluvian and postdiluvian age average out to be roughly 2,000 years each. And when you add them up, they equal about 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. And then we're, our dates are off a little bit because of switching over calendars and everything. And then they started at the birth of jesus christ and that the outpouring of the holy spirit the calendar so our ages here are a little bit off we have roughly two thousand years and we're at that two thousand year mark almost mm -hmm. so you're getting close to that six thousand that six thousand here you're really drawing it close to the end at this point mm -hmm. and it's important to try and soak up absolutely everything you can i get it this was a choppy lecture i'm sorry if it was hard to pay attention to um like i said it's been a little while since I um, did something here, but it's, it's oh so important now to really, really pay attention to what's happening in this school and try and learn absolutely everything you can. Some of us like me are very science minded. So that's what I tend to gravitate towards is this science stuff. Mm -hmm. But there are those principles in every single thing in your life. It doesn't have to be science. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be math. But in the end, you need that penny. And I can't say what that penny is for you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can imagine we've all heard the principle of the penny. Parable. Or parable of the penny. But as long as you're here and you're diligent and you willingly seek it out, that's what matters. Um, I think that's all I have for today. Quick question. Where's it going? Where's it going? Yeah. When is, is the, where's it going? When it decays? Yeah. It turns into carbon-12, a more stable molecule, but puts off that um, alpha particle. Okay. It's going back to pure spirit. Oh, wait. You're talking about that? Yeah. So it's ha it, it's disappearing after 6,000. Where's it going? This this is just turned out for I see what you're getting at, though. There's there's another lecture I'm kind of working on here that he's trying to get me to go towards. Yeah. That doesn't tie into this, though. Well, it's going, back but, to the, it's going back to the Father. It's going back to pure spirit, back to where it came from. 
Okay. All right. You're trying to tie in something I talked to you about that doesn't really fit with. Okay. But um, I think that's all I have to talk about for now. Thank you very much for listening. Praise and glory be to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next speaker is. Uh... Our next speaker today will be Dr. Joe Hughes. You, you can present your charts if you wish, Daryl. Okay. I will do that. I heard my name whispered there before it came out. <laughs> I like it. No, you didn't say Daryl. Yes, you did. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have something to say about our great creator. Um, and I enjoyed the remarks of the previous speakers. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit to, and I'm going to uh, try to pick up where it was left off. Uh, both speakers. Uh, the scripture lesson uh, is when Yahweh first spoke down the law. Israel gathered around the foot of the mountain and he spoke down the law. And it was already pointed out that he was basically the first part of the, the uh, chapter is, is the Ten Commandments, what has become known as the Ten Commandment law. And I do want to go back to that scripture lesson from the beginning, if somebody can get that for me. Start right at one. We got yep. it. And Yahweh spake all these all these words, saying, I am Yahweh thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other idols before me. Uh, I'm in a King James Version. Would you prefer that I have a holy name? No, that's fine. Okay. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, am a jealous El, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing so we, mercy unto, unto the thousands for a second. of them that love me. Oh, okay. So Yahweh is um he's speaking down and this this first commandment is that you, you that we're not going to have any any idols that we we got to love him and we're not going to have any idols before us and um we know that it's interesting what what hit me when sam was talking and when this was brought up by the first speaker too is look at yahweh was pure spirit we, we say in the moderation, Yahweh's pure spirit. And in this state, he's incomprehensible and inscrutable. See, um, we can't see or know Yahweh in this pure spirit state. But we know that uh, Yahweh did step forth right within himself as Elohim so that he could, so that we could know him. Um, and this happens in Moses' vision. We find out about this in Moses' vision. I'll, let me put it that way. Moses came up on this mount. This is after this happened in the chapter we read. Yeah, Yahweh first spoke down the law. Um, and Moses comes up. He made three visits up here. And in one of the visits, Yahweh Elohim appears to him as he appeared to everybody here. And uh, then he, he alone went up and by himself. And he sees Yahweh transform or transmutate into this tabernacle pattern, this threefold pattern. And then he shows Moses the days of creation coming in and how every one of those things happen according to his pattern. It's, it's not a wonder that we, can dis, we, we are shown revelations of these things like the previous speaker of how this creation goes by the pattern. This pattern is the pattern of Elohim. Say it's Elohim, the archetype pattern of the universe. And, and so when he created everything, he created it according to his pattern. Um, but, but uh, and he created everything. I mean, literally everything. Get me, where is it? It's in Colossians. Get me Colossians 1 and 16, please. He, he created Colossians. everything. Go ahead. Sorry. 1, 16, man. Mindset. Yeah. Colossians 1 verse 16 for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible 
whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And That's he right. is go ahead. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he's before all things. He's before all things. So when we get we go back into the ages and dispensations chart, and see the previous speaker talked about uh those diagrams looking like a cloud see we have the cloud in a lot of these charts the cloud is showing forth yahweh in his pure spirit state we say he's not a cloud he merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because it has no particular descriptive shape and form it's spirit it's pure spirit we're not able to see spirit we can't see spirit we could only we don't have spiritual the capabilities to see spirit with our physical eyes see he gave us a way to see, to understand him and and see, to get a glimpse in a sense by the types and shadows of the things that are made uh, um, through the witnesses he gave us of what, 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 what's, what is, what, uh, I'm stuttering here, but Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua are two manifestations of Yahweh in his pure spirit state. These are. This is Yahweh manifesting Himself in a physical state and in a um, through visions and getting into a physical body. See, and so the spirit is something that we can't see or know. Oops, went to the wrong one. In in this verse talked about He was before everything else. See, He created everything, but He was before everything else. There was not. There was nothing else, and there is nothing else. Uh, what's that verse? I am Yahweh and there is Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Go ahead and grab that for me. See, there there is there is there is nothing besides him. There really is nothing besides him, to be honest with you, um, except that which he created or begets, 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 <laughs> begets. Do we get that, Isaiah? Yep, Isaiah 46 and 9. Is that what you want? Remember the former things of old. Yes. For I am El, and there is none else. I am Elohim, and there is none like me. See, he, he is, there is no one else. There is none else. And he was in the beginning before he created this. We read in that script, the, the scripture, the last scripture, uh, that, that he created everything, and he was before all of those things. He was in the beginning, say. The, there was pure spirit, and that's why we talk about that on this this Moses chart in the beginning was pure spirit, see, and he was without shape and form, see, and we and we talk about how he manifested as Elohim, and in the scripture, uh, and we could we show that how how Genesis one is Moses is having this vision up here, um, and seeing the days of creation, and see Yahweh Elohim. Tr transmutated this creation came out and th or th and or through Yahweh Elohim say and everything that was created came out by according to this pattern and that's why we have this chart here shown like this because it's showing the threefold pattern of all of creation say and it's all going by this pattern see we we, we tend to focus on this pattern because we can't we can't break Yahweh down that <laughs> with our eyes, see? So he gave he gave Israel and all of us this pattern out here in the wilderness to show us him, see? Its whole purpose is to show us him, see? Um, get me uh, John 4 and 24. See? Yahweh is spirit, <laughs> we, and, and this is so important for us to always remember. None of this is are things that we made up. These charts are illustrations of of biblical passages that are in the law and the prophets and the fulfillment. Say, and and when you look on these, and we could use these, um, because there's 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 help. These these charts also help the speaker because there's there's scripture quoted on the charts to show us where you could find a lot of this stuff go ahead and get that John for me 424 for elohim is a spirit 
and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, he's spirit, and we have to worship him in spirit and in truth, see? Now, it may sound like I totally got off our scripture lesson, but there, <laughs> Yahweh says not to have any idols before you. Look at Yahweh is spirit. Everything else was made by him. It's him manifested in the in the he manifested in the flesh, but it's also him. Look at Dr. Kinley said that everything it was made from the spirit. Everything. And this is hard for people to grasp, but even the mystery of iniquity is abides within Yahweh and is made from Yahweh's substance. See, it all it all came forth out of spirit. Um, and that, and so when we look at the scripture about not having any false idols before us, <laughs> look at everything that's physical is its whole purpose is to show us him. See, its whole purpose is to show us him, not to worship anything to sh else, because there is none else. <laughs> There's nothing else for us to worship, really, if we're truly seeing things as they actually are, because it is all showing us Yahweh. It's all showing us Yahweh Elohim, say. And so there's the really, the so when we worship anything, and that's another thing I want to, when people read that scripture, people tend to think of gods, like, and Kathy gets into this a lot, and she does a very nice lecture on this, but um, people, when they think of, you know, don't have other gods, people think, you know, um, don't worship Buddha, don't worship Muhammad, don't worship, you know, whatever. They tend to think of people or, or other names of gods. But see, whenever we worship anything, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Anything that we worship, whether it be money or whether it be, you know, popularity or whether it be being, it doesn't matter. E even <laughs> it doesn't there, anything that we worship that isn't spirit is 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 idolatry and there is only one spirit there is only one spirit that's yahweh see yahweh elohim and so anything that we worship isn't if it isn't spirit it's idolatry and if we worship anything other than yahweh it is idolatry because it isn't he's the spirit he's the only one see and, it, and so when we come down here, and I'll tell you something, this is just a profound knowledge. And I, I harp on this, I think, because of, of my experience of having been in the church, in the in the seminary, and being a pastor of churches, and being an usher at Billy Graham's, Graham's concert, concerts, yeah, right, his his shows, um, in, in, in seeing people try to, you know, having so many people trying to understand, I brought this up in a class the other day. People, when you go to college for, uh, you go to seminary to be ordained as a minister, most churches, it's getting a master's degree. It's graduate school. First, you have to do undergrad, and then you have to go to graduate school for most churches, not all churches, but most of the really established churches. It's a master's of divinity, they call it. And the number of books that you get for each class is phenomenally large. It's not having one or two textbooks. Most of the classes have between five and eight textbooks for each class per semester. And you're expected to read all this. And you go into this school, and this is a school where people are learning about supposedly learning to teach people or to, to, to preach to people about God. And they don't have a clue of anything that's going on. In, P in each of these classes, the school I went to is ecumenical. Everybody has a different opinion about God in every topic that you could think of. As many people there are, there are opinions about God. And they're all different because nobody has a clue of how to come to understand him, say. They don't know how to know him. And this is another thing. When you study something, uh, uh, when I'm working at, worked on my PhD, you, you learn about doing research and they talk about philosophy. Um, and philosophy has to do with how you come to know things. That's what philosophy is. That's what it's about. It's, it's about knowledge. Um, and it comes from the word philos, which comes from the Greek word for love. It has to do with a love of knowledge, see? 
And in the big tenet with philosophers, there's words that they use. Um, ontology, ontological, onto, ontological um, has to do with, we, we say, Dr. Kinley talked about um, Yahweh Elohim in his, um, how did he work? It was, it was him and his ontological, his ontological perfection. Ontological has to do with, it comes from philosophy and it has to do with what something is, how it actually exists. That's what it means. So philosophers talk about how something actually exists. And then they talk about how do you come to know how something actually exists? How do you come to know the truth about something? And that's called epistemology. It has to do with coming to know something. Um, and, and different groups of science have different epistemologies. They, they've debated about how it is that you could come to know something. Yahweh has given us the epistemology of how to, how to come to know him. <laughs> He's told us how to come to know him. He's given us that ability of how to come to know him. He gave us a way for us to do it. Yeah. Uh, get me uh, Isaiah. What do I want here? Uh, get me, actually, let's get a few verses. Uh, I want, uh, I'm going to want Isaiah. Why, why is my mind going blank? Blank. 8 and 20. I want Isaiah 8 and 20. I want Acts 7 and 44, um, and I want Romans 1, 19 and 20. Could you give me those three verses? Isaiah. Isaiah 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. That's right. To the law and to the testimony. See? If they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. The law and the testimony are Yahshua's witnesses. See, this is this is a basic way that we will come to know Yahweh. He gave us these ways of coming to know him, and the law and the testimony are one way to come to know them. People are, even in the seminary, people are so confused about that book. It is such a great mystery. The people don't, they don't know how to interpret it because it is a great mystery. Yahshua has to show us this stuff. Um, give me one of the other ones, please. Acts 7, verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. That's right. Now, when Yahweh was, when Moses, Yahweh's called Moses up to this, uh, on top of this mountain, he showed him this tabernacle pattern and he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it, to have it built exactly like it in the wilderness, say. And this wasn't done according to men, say. We talk about there's a couple of things only that, that Yahweh asked men to make three, I believe it is, uh, the ark, the tabernacle, and the temple, say. And he he had to make this exactly like, like he showed it to him in the mount. And I'm not going to get the scriptures right now, because, um, but he, he had to put his spirit in the people that made this because it was going to be exactly like it was in the wilderness. I mean, exactly like he showed it to him. It had to be made perfectly, see? He was showing him this tabernacle because this tabernacle is a pattern that shows forth Yahweh, and it shows forth Yahweh Elohim, see? It shows forth, and I'm not going to get into it now. I just want to say that there's, there's, we have these ways of knowing Him. This is the epist This is Yahweh's epistemology. This is, this is the way He said that you come to know something. See, and give me that last one. Romans 1:19, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh hath showed it unto them. Keep going. Oh, I lost for it. the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. See, even, go ahead. Sorry. Finish it. <laughs> even his eternal power and supernal nature so that they are without excuse. Say, we, Yahweh's pure spirit. We had no way of knowing him in this state. See? So he made the creation so that we could know him. 
And he made the tabernacle so that we could know him. See, he gave us the law and the prophets so that we could know him. See, the in, in the physical creation, his purpose is to show us him. He's the one we're supposed to serve. He's the one we're supposed to praise. He's he. We shouldn't have any other gods before us in anything that we put. We you know, and people see this creation and they see the marvelous beauty of it and the tremendous glory in it. So much so to the point that people throughout history have come to worship the creation itself. Say, they've come to worship the sun and have sun gods. Um, they worship. Uh, just about everything that was created has probably been worshipped. That's beautiful part of nature. You know, people have worshipped rocks. People have worshipped. People have worshipped all of these kind of things. But all of this is is showing is supposed to show forth him. Say, I, I did have a, a a teacher when I was. This was in seminary, I think. My, I, I went to Bible undergrad school for a little while too. I'm not sure which one it was. It was talking about. Um, Genesis 1, <laughs> and he made sort of an interesting point at the time that, that sort of stuck with me, but people, people, I'm not saying it, it's anything based on the truth, but it was just sort of interesting, sort of like the quote that Patty read. Sometimes people say things, they have no idea they're saying something that's that that touches upon the truth because they don't really understand it. Um, get me Genesis um, 1, 1 and 1. And I'm going to be down here in a minute. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And the earth became without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, Let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided between the light and between the darkness. And Elohim called the light day. In the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the water from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Wait, can, can, could you could you read it? I think you're reading out of the Holy Name of Bible, right? Yeah. Could, could I get that read out of the King James? Yep. Um, start from one and one again. Yeah, you can start from one and one. I I I just want to point something out. Um, so yeah, start from one and one. We won't have to read all through it again. But there's something that's a little bit different worded in King James. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth. Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And Elohim said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay. Elohim, if you read through that, you'll see that after he creates different things, he, he's in the King James Version, it says it was good frequently. I think the holy name changed it to it was so. Um the, when the I had this professor, it just struck me. I had this professor talk about why, because people try to interpret why, interpret why. And look, and look, they got so much stuff wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying like this guy was enlightened in any way. Um, they actually, uh, they don't understand why it. Uh, well, I'm getting off topic. Let me finish my first thought. <laughs> Anyways, he said, he said the reason it said that. Uh, Genesis 1 was written this way and it said good and it was good and it was good when he created different things. He said that, the, the, well, there's a school of people that believe that that chapter was written to prevent people from worshiping the creation, that it wasn't supposed to be about the creation. He made it, it was good. He made it, it was good. I thought it was sort of interesting. Um, but the truth is we're not supposed to be worshiping the creation. 
we're supposed to be seeing how the creation shows forth Yahshua. And everything that we do that isn't worshiping Yahshua is idolatry. There really is nothing else to worship. And we really worship, and we can worship things in many different ways. Um, let's let's get the word uh, worship in a dictionary. Does anybody have a dictionary? Somebody grab a dictionary and look that word up for me. Checking. We have a paper dictionary. Um, I have it here out of the Oxford Dictionary, if you'd like that. Sure. Um, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. Um, verb, show reverence or adoration for a deity, honor with religious rites. Is, like that, more to... is there more? Um, the... Acts or rights to make up formal expression or reverence for a deity, religious ceremony or ceremonies, um, adoration or devotion comparable to religious homage shown towards a personal principle. We have archaic and British here. Archaic, honor given to someone in recognition of their merit. British, used in addressing, in addressing or referring to an important or high-ranking person, especially a magistrate or a mayor. Um, do you, have, do you happen to have an etymology in yours or no? Uh, I'm not really seeing one here, no. Okay, I, I have one here, actually. It says from Middle English, let's see, to honor, esteem. Um, they bring it back to, uh, if you keep going back in the etymology, it goes back to value. Worshipping is really giving a lot of value to something. That's really the etymology of it. Um, it's valuing something. And, and I, I want to say that because if we value, if we value something more than Yahweh Elohim, you know, uh, we have this tendency to think that, that, you know, worshiping and having something be our idol means that it, you know, we, we tend to look at it in sort of a, a way that's been created by the churches uh, but the truth is that when we value something more than something else, you could say you're worshiping it more. They really have to do with very similar ideas. If when we value anything more than our creator, we're committing a, um, idolatry. Right. When we value anything more than our creator, we're committing idolatry. Because either we're worshiping that more than or Yahweh, or, or we're not really worshiping Yahweh because it's not that high of a value, see? So when we put things before him, that, that's idolatry. And that, you know, that's, that's it, it really covers everything because there is nothing else. <laughs> and there's nothing else to, to be with. Um, uh, so I did, I, I was going to say something else. I, I'm going to, this is a little bit off that topic, but it, I remembered when I was reading, when I was in the seminary and they were, they were, you know, starting with the Bible and they go into Genesis in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the scholars. Um, I always go to this first, but I'm going to get it again. Give me Romans 10 and one. It's, I can never get away with this verse, away from this verse. <laughs> Romans 10, verse 1. Um, <clears throat> Brethren, my heart desires and prayers to Yahweh for Israel is that they might be saved. For bear them record that they have a zeal of Yahweh, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Yahweh. For the Messiah is the end of the sacrificial law for the obtaining of righteousness to everyone that believeth. Yeah. For most you, you can stop there. Look at Yahweh is the end of the law for Yahweh is the end of righteous righteousness itself. He is it. He's the only righteous one. But when we're ignorant, when people are ignorant, they go about to establish their own righteousness and they go about to try to understand things and they make up things that they don't really know for a certainty or, com or, or can prove, um, but just go about saying things or trying to make sense of things that doesn't make sense to them. Um, and when you read, 
this 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 was taught in a seminary class I was in. There's uh, they don't understand why as they read through Genesis, just the the you know starting with Genesis and reading through it, they don't understand why sometimes it says Yahweh, why sometimes it says Yah, why sometimes it says Elohim, why sometimes it says El. They don't understand that. Um, because they don't understand the, the meaning of the, the name, which which is in his title, which which is another one of the commandments that was mentioned. See, and they they um, actually have a Bible. What the way they explain it? This is them going about to establish their own understanding. The way that they explain it, some people, they actually have a Bible that's color coded. In in uh, I don't know if it includes the law and the prophets and the fulfillment. It seems like it was more from the law and the prophets, um, but they have a, a Bible that's color coded based on what they think is uh, written by different people than what the Bible's attributed to. So, for example, in Genesis, they believe there were multiple authors of Genesis, and they color code uh, sentences that. Uh, and statements based on authors, so they they don't know who the author. They you know their their argument is they don't know who the author is, um, and then they but they believe they're different author authors based on I use the names, but it's based on other things like the the style of writing and different things. Um, and they have like one author might be red and one's blue and one's green and one's yellow and one's you know brown. I don't remember the colors, and and the Bible's actually written. And if you start a Genesis, you'll see colors for sentences, and then another sentence will be different, and then another sentence will be different, um, claiming that they're written by different people because they don't understand it. This is in the seminary I'm talking about. This is in a, a seminary, a, per, a prominent, prominent, this isn't just like some backyard thing. Um, I went to Colgate Divinity School, Rochester Colgate Divinity School, which was actually a merger of. I think like four different seminaries, one of which, and this is in Rochester, New York, one of which was was one of the seminaries or schools that Martin Luther King Jr. went to. I mean, this 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 is and this is and in, in this is in, in the school they teach this. In the seminary, and this is another thing, because it talks about his name and not taking it in vain, making it sound like it's not important. In the seminary, you learn Hebrew and Greek. And you learn to read it. And I took Hebrew and Greek, and it wasn't, I didn't become, um, I didn't become proficient in it. But one of the first things you learn is Yahweh um, and Elohim <laughs> and Yah. Yeah. You learn these things, and, and, you, and they know, they know about Exodus, uh, about what, ha you know, they know that. When Moses came to this bush in the wilderness in Exodus, um, they'll tell you, they'll they'll teach you that that Moses asked him what the name was because there were lots of names and lots of gods, and that he told Moses Yahweh. They know this. Any minister that goes to school and studies it in these seminaries learn that Yahweh was said to Moses at this burning bush. They know this, and I knew it, but I didn't know it, say, because this is, you have to be, this stuff does have to be revealed to you. I went to the seminary. Um, I got in an argument with Jehovah Witness about, before I came into class about, well, if you're going to use the right name, you should use Yahweh. But you notice that when I was then, I was putting in, well, if you're going to use the right name, because I didn't want to think, I didn't want to admit that it was important, say, but it is important. <laughs> It is important. We just read it in the scripture lesson today. <laughs> what did he say? Let's get let's get that commandment out of there, out of that chapter. I want well, right in Exodus twenty, it, it brought it up, did it not? Our scripture lesson today. Oh, verse seven. Verse seven. Okay, I'm sorry. Exodus twenty and seven. Thou shalt not take away the name of Yahweh thy Elohim to bring it to naught. Now I like the way he put that. Because that's what means to take it in vain. People like to put something different on it, but to 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 take some to make something in vain means to make it not important. It makes make it useless. See, 
And see, when I was when I learned this in the seminary school, I knew that it said Yahweh, but I, I made it not important. I said, you know, what everybody, what all Christians say when you bring up this to them, they say, well, he doesn't care what you call him. <laughs> and that's just not, that's so not true. He cares what you call him. It's, it's, it matters, see? Um, it matters to him a lot. And it's not, give me Psalms 135 and 13. And also give me. Um, Psalms 135 and 13. Right. Thy name Yahweh endureth forever. And thy memorial, O Yahweh, throughout all generations. It endureth forever. It's all generations. It's not It's not something that was only supposed to be used at one time. You can't find any evidence in the book about how, well, more people are familiar with this. See, that's what the Jehovah's use to defend not saying Yahweh. Um, somebody got into this in a lecture we listened to last week. That's what the Jehovah's use. When you bring up Yahweh to them, they say, well, Yash, uh, Jehovah's more familiar. Well, it wasn't more familiar when they started using it, the person in class brought up. It was, it was just as, you know, wrong. And they knew it. They knew it was Yahweh. See? And I'll tell you, Christians use the same excuse. They, they say the same thing. But let me tell you something. They'll say that, but um, let, them, let them try to uh, try to. So tell them, well, if it's not that important, why don't, why don't you say a different name? <laughs> don't say Jesus. Tell, tell a Christian not to say Jesus. Well, it's not important that you call him Jesus, so don't say it. Go ahead and give that a try. People will die in the name of Jesus. For that name, they would die. And they have died because of that name. Christians have died. They've been persecuted, too, over time. People that used the name Jesus at one time. Yeah, so um, I'm I, I'm just so thankful that this this was such a beautiful. I always love when I see the physical examples that show forth our Creator because they're so profoundly consistent and accurate and always. And whenever we come to and we make mistakes and we don't know everything, so when we're learning stuff, those witnesses are so important. They're so important. Working in therapy, you can't know the difference between uh, the way that you know the difference between a, a, delu a delusion or a lie and the truth are witnesses. In, so it's like in psychology, we call uh, delu we, we talk about delusions in my, my field. A delusion, the definition of a delusion is believing in something in, in spite of, of evidence to the contrary. Somebody comes to me in my office and says someone's trying to kill me. That could be true or not true. Um, I would ask, what are the witnesses? <laughs> what are your witnesses? You know, what, where, where are your witnesses? We can never give these witnesses up. These witnesses are the only way for us to know these, these things that we've come to know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to somebody else. Uh, I love being here. love being in class. Love all of you guys. I've enjoyed class so far and hope to continue enjoying it. And all praises and glory go to Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, thank you, Dr. Hughes, for your testimony. And our next speaker will be Dr. Lionel Van Maju from Hamilton, Ontario. Here we go. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Or good afternoon, I guess it is. So um, I'm not going to take a ton of time. I just want to take a few moments and share a couple things, I guess, and give a bit of a testimony and go from there. So I uh, really appreciate the previous vessels uh, speaking, and I appreciate everyone taking the time to learn and, and slow it down to learn some of Yahweh's purpose and plan. And uh, the science aspect is wonderful, and that's Yahweh's not leaving people with no uh not leaving people with with uh an excuse and and leaving them 
in a position where they have nothing to go with. So if you go, let's go to the scripture lesson and let's do that for a second. Let's go back there to the first verse. And, and it's important that, yeah, when now we brought the children of Israel out of Egypt here, and my camera would be kind of wonky back and forth since I'm doing it sort of myself or not, to, whatever. But, so, yeah, we brought the children of Israel. To, it's all according to Yahweh's will. Yahweh is pure spirit, right? And Yahweh take, you know, took on shape and form right then as Yahweh Elohim. We'll, we'll touch on that. And it's all to do his will. And when you think about Sam and Nick were exchanging back and forth about the decaying and carbon 14 and so forth, that, that some things decay and some things regenerate all according to Yahweh's purpose and plan. And if you think about the cycle of water with the evaporation and it becomes clouds and clouds come down and provide precipitation to provide vegetation and life, it's all that cycle and cycle and cycle over again. And it's the same thing with those covenants that are set up that Yahweh set forth an old covenant over here that was given to Moses. And there was a covenant before this because the covenant, the, the commandment of circumcision was given over there to Abraham to be circumcised. But that was carried on through Moses and so on. And there was a covenant back with Noah with regards to that, that rainbow sign that he always not going to take the world out by water anymore. It, he's going to kill people with water or, or some people die every year from floods and typhoons and all those things. But he's not taking out the creation water. We'll take out the fire next time or at the end of end of the, this current age that we're in the consuming fire because he always is consuming fire and he made a commandment and all those things with the, you know going back to adam and eve as well and through their seed to be fruitful and leading you all down to the lineage of yashua messiah the 63rd generation which you can pick up on some of the other charts you have with, with this is and so on okay so let's let's start at the beginning of um exodus 20 verse 1 and Elohim spake all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, they Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of That's Egypt. That's important. So that they're not going to forget. They're being reminded again. I am Yahweh, thy Elohim, who brought you out of Egypt. So before you go ahead and put someone else or some other deity or claim that a calf brought you out, he's telling you again and again that the credit and glory goes to him. Not man, not Moses. It goes to him. It's his purpose. He's looking for the glory over and over again. He will get that glory whether you're going to give it or not. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So the book also tells you that. Read on. Out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no Elohim before me. Yeah, out of the house of bondage. Now they came out of a out of a house that had lots of different idols, right? The Egyptian sun god, frog god, water god, whatever. You can study Egyptology, Egyptology on your own and look up all the gods and so forth. But that he's saying that he's the one, because there is none before, none other. And these are just figments of man's imagination. But man exalts those things to think that it's something when it's not, right? Just like with Diana worship and the statue of worship, to thinking it's something it's not. Those idols that speak, or that man's looking for answers from, but the idol doesn't speak. It's just nailed there. It just sits there. But Yahweh is working through his creation. He gives you witnesses and, and operating his purpose and plan to accomplish his will. Read on. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. So you want to read the third verse again? Third. Thou shalt have no Elohim before me. Now, if you look in your Bible, if the King James, you look in the holy name, it's a lowercase Elohim, a lowercase Elohim there that's not a name right yahweh is pure spirit takes on shape and form as elohim yes as yahweh elohim right elohim is a title right but unlike lord and god elohim is a divine title he's affixing it's yahweh elohim and it's yahweh in its elohimistic state and form here it's shape and a form but you could like your visionary shape and form with hands and feet and a body as these 74 souls moses aaron native and a body and the seven elders saw him in that visionary shape and form and he's taking on physical shape and form he dwelt among him down here in egypt who's going to bring them up they heard their cries okay it's important to recognize it's yahweh elohim right that there is no other uh, gods or deities and so on okay uh, go down just keep going in fact keep going for thou shalt not make unto thee any graven idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth yeah. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh the Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting Speak. the iniquity 
And he's merciful because he says, don't bow to anything you see in the heavens, the sky, the water, etc. Don't make that calf, which is which that pops up later on the story where they show the disobedience, the children of Israel down over here. But Yahweh provides a way of escape. He provides that way of solution for them. So, hey, you don't worship any of those things, but wait, he's going to dwell with them. Flip over to Exodus 25. And we'll go over there because it talks about the pattern. And, and Sam talked about the pattern as well. 25 and 1. Exodus 25, 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying. And we start there because we want to know who's speaking to who, what, where, and when, right? Other than who said, you know, you want to know who's speaking so you can line up your witnesses properly. Okay, read on. Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Now they came out of here with great substance. You can read about that at the bottom of the third chapter of Exodus, where they come out with great substance, various places, or maybe it's the fourth chapter of Exodus at the beginning. They came out with great substance. So wow, look at the loop we got leaving our state of bondage. So we're leaving here with great substance. Boy, we're gonna leave our houses behind where we spend all of our time, but down here or a good chunk of their time and some people their whole lifetime. Look at the stuff they have, look at the things that we have for us, but wait. That's not Yahweh's will. The things and talents that he gives you aren't for your benefit. They're to work benefit for his glory. The talents you have, whether it's to sing, write, study, present, listen, find scriptures, those things aren't for your glory. It's look how great I am. I could find it like that and wherever he is. No, it's for his glory to prove his purpose and his will. That what? Those things that came down here were going to be used for their, their tabernacle. And when they were disobedient, they said, look, some of these folks had earrings. They break off their earrings, right? <laughs> they're, they're using these things for their own benefit, as it were. But they, those things were to help fashion this tabernacle over here. They didn't have to go mining in the in the, in the wilderness for, for stuff. They didn't have to go foraging for things. They already had it. Yahweh provides. He's El Shaddai. We don't? Or, yeah. Um, of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. So the gift you have that Yahweh gave to you through his grace and mercy, you give of that willingly. There's no basket. There's no, nothing's going to pop on the screen that's going to say send money somewhere. We're just operating out of a living room with a bunch of charts. And we're here to preach the gospel because that needs to go out. Now, sure, there may be a couple people here, record it, we'll post it, whatever else. If people come across it through the different computer algorithms, great. But these things are to be presented and shared, and the gospel must be preached. You can't hide it. You don't want to hide your, your blessing behind a bushel, as it were, or the glory. And that glory that, or anything that any of us have received, it's that revelation through Yahweh. And it's Yahshua's the teacher. He's going to teach you all things. And when he's taught you stuff, we think we know it. He's going to, you know, but we're going to forget it. And he's going to bring it back to our remembrance. Wow. Yeah, that's how it is. And, you know, not all of us are neuroscientists. Not all of us are, are physicians. And all of us are whatever it is. Even though we took all those courses, history, science, chemistry, some of us aren't in that field, but yet we listened to those lectures because it didn't click. There was no revelation for us that that's our calling to do it. And it's Yahshua, that spirit that operates, creates those things as a calling in you to go pursue and, and preach and teach those things. Okay, read on. And this is the offering which you shall take of Go them. Go down to eight, I guess. Sorry. Eight. And let them make me a sanctuary. That's, this is what they let them. It's Yahweh Ellison. Let them make me a sanctuary here in the wilderness, right? That they may dwell among them, right? According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make And make this pattern. And Sam spent some time talking about science. And science follows that pattern. And if you watch the screen, Daryl had up the green chart. The green chart shows science and the creation made in Yahweh's uh, purpose and plan. All these types of these charts have titles, as it were. But this pattern here is not just something in the wilderness, but this, this chart also follows a pattern. It's hard to tell in this chart from the viewers there, but this section up here in Canada has, has a most holy place painted on here. This middle section here, the wilderness of science, has a holy place. The things happening in this band are pertaining to the holy place. The things happening in the bottom part here are pertaining to the outer court of the court roundabout. They're pertaining to those things there. That this chart is also following a pattern, as is as is this chart, and all the charts are all following this kind of same pattern. The elementary chart is showing the same kind of pattern. We play it's most holy place, the holy place court roundabout or outer court. These same things are happening over and over again. That now we brought them out of wilderness. Yeah, thank you. Right, brought them out of the wilderness to show them things. And we were just at a seminar in Chicago and they talked about you know be staying in the holy place. Now listen, this chart blocks out or shows that this things are happening here. There's the holy place where Yahweh's giving them a pattern here. 
down here, the things they brought from Egypt with them, the physical, tangible things that they brought from them, and the witnesses of that spirit stand still and see the salvation. They brought those things over into this thing. The physical things help fashion this tabernacle. That spirit that's operating, so instead of standing still, is that same spirit that's going to operate here with this tabernacle. That was that minister back here with Moses, Joshua, right? And, and the whole world, the Joshua, son of none, Moses come up alone. But what? Was he disobedient? No, it's Yahweh in a physical body. He heard their cries and he went down. He was witnessing. He's delivering them. He's working with Moses, but he's there delivering them, working his purpose all down the line. He's the author and he's the finisher of our faith, which you can read Hebrews, the 12th chapter. But here they've read the fashion of this tabernacle, but in the same section of the holy place, you get the tabernacle, the things that you should do, worship Yahweh, you should dwell among them. But yet you also have that mystery of iniquity, a wandering around as well out there, doing his own thing, trying to cause confusion. So you got to stick to those bases, and, and maybe I got it wrong or right with what with, with, with Sam was talking about. But those those protons when they're or those electrons are losing the light, they kind of go back into the center. They go back into the proton or the new, you know, they go back into the focus on those things to get their energy back to then re radiate the light. And when we have confusion, what do we do? Well, we go back to the foundation. We go back to the fundamentals. When the children of Israel had problems here and it sinned, they went back and they had to go offer things and the, the sacrifices here. And right, you stand the holy place, and when you stand the holy place. You stand at something that you know and being assured of, and the witnesses all dictate those things. You know, was some people veered off here, and this age and dispensation we're in now. I'll flip this here. I'm not going to speak for twenty too much longer anyway. But in this age that we're in right now, here here this age began not the cross, but again, the God the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. Then you have the closure of that old covenant over here is set to be that even the angels and the prophets inquired what Yahshua had to say or the spirit was going to operate. And here the Holy Spirit's poured out and they're preaching the gospel in First Corinthians back over here in this part of the church, telling the people, hey, we're all supposed to be one spirit. How there be no divisions among you? Yet there's divisions among you. How could it be? And at the end of the age and so forth, here's the founder coming all along over here where he received, not of his own will, not of his decision to have a vision. He received a vision from Yahweh Ellen over here. He's preaching, hey, listen, you know, you stick to the things you've been given and proven. And his vision that he received is the same that Moses and John received. Moses is receiving a vision over here. And John is receiving a vision over here in this age. And, and the kingly saying, hey, my vision doesn't superpose us. I'm confirming what Moses and John saw. The things that you and I need to sustain us spiritually, the spiritual food, that manna to carry us up, that, that spiritual manna to carry us and hang on to, to wrap up at the end of this age, when that we can know something about Yahweh and we can look back with the surety at all those witnesses all down the line. They're all following what? They're all following that pattern of death, burial, resurrection. And you know, death, burial, resurrection. And when you resurrect, you have that ascension, working the whole process again, just like the things break you down, decaying, the flesh is going to decay. But wait, there's a spirit in a man. And that spirit is that spirit of Yahweh, revealed through Yahshua the Messiah, that we're all supposed to have that Holy Spirit. And that spirit is that part of that reconciliation that is spoken of in Ephesians, the ninth chapter, right? That nine and one, where all things are, well, get that nine and, uh, um, Ephesians 1 and 9, I think. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his good will. He made it known. And that's merciful. He made it known. We didn't sit there and conjure like just like Daryl is talking about. All kinds of people have all kinds of pains of all kinds of things. But wait, forget about what you and I think. Go back to the book. He made it known. We kept that. Having made known unto us the mystery of his good will. Yeah. It just says his will. Excuse yeah, me. That's fine. According to his good pleasure. His good pleasure. His <laughs> will. His pleasure. His purpose. His creation as much as beautiful. His thing. His talents. His substance that he gave us. His revelation. His, 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 his. He's working with us. And how grateful it is he's working with us to accomplish his will through the vessels that he has. But it's his plan. You know? Which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in the Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, yeah. even in him. Gather all things together in him, right? Gather all things together in that spiritual body of Yahshua the Messiah, right? That's his do. He's gonna bring all those things, reconcile in that spiritual body. You look at a physical body. Right, stand in the holy place, right? Who in the holy place? Through the door. Yahshua's the door, right? 
you know, they hand they knock at the door and invite you in and stuff as Kim is talking about in the prayer, right? Those things are important to be mindful of, okay? Uh, go to uh, uh, Hebrews 8 chapter, last verse. So sorry, I just wanted to take a, wanted to take a couple of minutes anyway. But, but, but that came to me when I was thinking of listening to Sam and Nick and exchanging conversation at the end, talking about the decay. When things decay and break down, they become what? Fertilizer, right? So that brings with that new life, you know, that new opportunity. Those children of Israel, the first generation died here, you know, above a certain age, died of carcasses in the wilderness. What? So a new generation carried on with witnesses of Caleb, Phineas, and Eliezer down here in Fort Joshua. Moses wasn't going on here. Moses was the type of shadow of that low priest, right? Who'd operate in the outer court or the court roundabout and, and operate in the holy place, but he wasn't going to go over here. But he could see over there. He was shown to see how the promise had come to be. Okay. 8 and 13 yep. of Hebrews. Yep. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Yep. Now yep. that which decayed. That first covenant of old. The, the circumcision, circumcision ceremonies, baptism, that's old. The wax is away. There's no value in that anymore. There is a spiritual counterpart to those things. There's a spiritual counterpart, but these things are wax old. That wait, you can have that new written in your new heart and mind, as, as Daryl was talking with Jeremiah as well, right? And and all those things are so beautiful. Read on, if that's the last of it. Uh. And now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Decayed, old, vanish away, right? It's of no it's of no value anymore. But wait, we have a, a, this calling, it's Josh the Messiah in us. That's that regeneration, right? That's important. Anyway, I thank you for the opportunity. I'll yield the floor. Thank you very much for your testimony, Dr. Van Maju. <clears throat> And our next speaker for this morning, if she's capable, will be Dr. Sarah Lattimore. Oh, you're not off the uh -huh. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. I really, really, whoa, and rolling down our charts. Um, I right. really. In our book, Sarah, we, uh, we, we didn't get you last week for your Chicago testimony, et cetera. So. Yeah, I knew I would be off the book. Thanks. Um, I've really, really enjoyed class so far today. It's been, uh, it's been, it's been wonderful. Um, and jumping right into the scripture lesson, you know, it's just talking about that old covenant and in the new covenant and how we're not under that old law. It was contrary to them. They could not keep the law. They couldn't do it. Um, and it was also for a time then present. So getting into the scripture lesson um sam can you or someone it. go ahead right one. yeah just pick it up at one for another real quick it's exodus uh 20 verse 1. and elohim spake all the these words saying i am yahweh thy elohim which have brought thee out of the land of egypt out of the house of bondage thou shalt have no other l before me so look i'm the one that got you out of here all right yahweh elohim is the one he said right back here at the burning bush, told Moses, go down and get him out of here. And he did. He it, through, he really proved himself to be Yahweh, all of them, to, to these people. And and Pharaoh had had enough, and he's like, just get out of here. Just leave. And and they gave them their gold, and their, their they spoiled them, right? They, they took everything that they could, everything they wanted from the Egyptians was given. Just get out. Just, just leave. Mm -hmm. So they did. Yahweh delivered them through the red sea and and they were down in darkness here in this outer court and in bondage in slavery and and no hope yahweh came down and showed them yeah we're we're leaving and got them up out now they went through the red sea mm -hmm. the red sea was it opened and it was like a tunnel that they walked through on dry land now these are insane things that they saw back here all the plagues that they saw that that yahweh that yahweh caused then let them out of bondage. The Egyptians gave them everything they wanted, just said leave. Then they go through the Red Sea, cross on dry ground, ground, and come out into the wilderness of Sinai. Now look, they came out of the outer court. Now they're up in the holy place. Right. That's what the, the theme of the Chicago um, seminar that we were just at was, what does it mean to stand in the holy place? Well, 
you're out of bondage, right? You're out of this darkness in this and and doing all of these physical carnal things. You're out of it. You don't have to do this anymore. Now you're brought up a little higher, so to speak, into the wilderness of Sinai. Now this is where after everything they, they witnessed and after everything that they did and Yahweh brought them up out of here. Now they saw it, skip down through there. I want where um, the, 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 the trembling and the, um, it's towards the end. Forgive me. I don't have my book in front of me where they saw it. Um, Eighteen, I believe. Yes, it, yes, please. Yep. All right. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Scared them. Yep. It really terrified them. Like they wet themselves. Really terrified. So they witnessed all these plagues. They crossed through the Red Sea. They're brought out here into the wilderness of Sinai. Yahweh speaks to them from the mountain. They saw the thundering, the lightning, the smoke. In um, one scripture, it says that all that Yahweh says we will do, we'll do it. So there's a covenant and a marriage right there. They said, I do, right? So now they're brought up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. So this isn't just one or two people. This is 70 plus people that were brought up here and shown a vision, Yahweh Elohim, right? And they did eat and drink. So Yahweh introduced, Yahweh Elohim introduced him to them. Like, look, you're made in my likeness and image. I look like you. I have a body. I have hands. I have feet. I have a head. We ate. We drank. I spoke. So introduced himself to them. Now, what's it say in the beginning of the scripture that Yahweh doesn't care what you call him? That, that it doesn't matter what name you use, um, you know, that I'm fine with that. You can call me whatever you want, just as long as you know who I am. It doesn't say that. No, what does it say? Read it, please. Um, we'll jealous. Go, we'll, uh, you are the jealous? I am a jealous owl. There shall be no owl him before me. Yahweh is a jealous owl. It says it in the scripture. He's jealous. Yep, like, I'm trying to find it. He does not want you to worship any graven images, and he lays down the law there for these people, too. You're not Five. supposed to cheat, no stealing, don't covet what someone else has, don't want whatever what someone else does, no keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak, right? Did you find that for me? Verse 5. Read, please. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, thy Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third. So he point. is a jealous El. He wants you to use his name, as it says back in Exodus 12, with Moses at the burning bush, and he gave him his name. It's my memorial unto all generations forever. Well, as far as I know, we're still in, uh, we're, we're, that's still us. We are all generations, right? We are. So there's no way, shape or form, that you can pull out of this book anywhere where it tells you, you can call Yahweh whatever you want to call him as long as he knows that you're talking to him. It doesn't say, go ahead and use Jesus, you know, it really doesn't matter. That is not what Yahweh says. And he says he's jealous and he lays it out what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. You are supposed to have no Elohim before him. So getting back to this, now people, the reason I'm going into this in, in the holy place here is, well, let me just say this. So they, 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 they witnessed this, right? They saw it. These ones that were brought up a little higher saw Yahweh Elohim, all the children of Israel, saw this mountain quake and on fire and they heard Yahweh and it was terrifying. They went through all of these things, as we've said. Then what do they do? What did they do when they came down off the mount? They broke off their hearing or gave their, their earrings and their gold away and they built a golden calf. Contrary to what Yahweh Elohim told them to do. You shall have no Elohim before me. Um. I, I have the jealous L thing if you want that yeah, real quick. Please. Exodus 34, verse 14. For thou shalt worship no other L. For Yahweh, who is jealous of his name, is a jealous L. He's jealous of his name. He's a jealous L. There's no way that you are going to get away with calling Yahshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ. There's no salvation in that name. It's wrong. It's erroneous. Some men made it up. Some men took it out of the book. And it's going to kill you. 
It's going to kill your soul forever. You can't use that name. You have to know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. That's the first aim of the Institute. Now, we know his name. He's introduced himself to us. We have an intimate knowledge and understanding of our Heavenly Father through his creation. The Adam, the smallest part that, that Sam went into and showed us how that shows Yahweh Elohim. You look around in the creation, it constantly shows Yahweh Elohim and it shows the death, burial, and resurrection over and over and over again. We have proof. We have evidence. We have substance. We've seen it. We've heard it. We witnessed it. Don't go build in a golden calf. Mm -hmm. What happened to them? <clears throat> what Yahweh do to them? Killed he killed them. He killed them. Their physical lives killed them. Done. You, you didn't obey. What's Yahweh going to do to us? If once we are brought into this gospel, in this truth, in this understanding, and we know the name of our Heavenly Father, and if we're going to go and turn and say that salvation comes in any other name other than Yahshua, the Messiah, you're going to lose your soul. Your soul, which is your eternal life. Now, that is a scary thing. And what it means to stand in the holy place, it means that we, look, we, we've got food, right? This, this um, table of showbread that was food for the, for the priest that was in there. There was always light. They were never, no darkness in this holy place. There could not be darkness in the holy place. Yeah. That lamp had to be going all the time or the sun had to show the light in this tabernacle. And there's an intercessor here between you and Yahweh because we aren't allowed up in here yet. Just like that high priest was only allowed in there once a year. And it was a big deal. He had to do everything just right to atone for the sins of all of the children of Israel. We're not allowed up in here yet. We got to stand in the holy place. Now, what it means to stand in the holy place is to take on that armor of Yahweh. We've been given a knowledge and an understanding. We know that this old covenant, this old way of worship that was given unto the children of Israel, as we read in our scripture lesson, and that was physically so. That's physical things that we had to do. Now, we know that Yahshua the Messiah came in to fulfill everything. He came in to fulfill, not to institute. And, uh, you know, a funny thing about that is um, I take this coffee cup, right, and fill it up, fill it right up. You don't keep pouring the coffee and dumping it out because it's a waste. It's going to go all over the floor. It's going to be a mess. When it's full and it's filled, there's no room for anything else. It's done. You, you can't put any more in this cup. It's just going to overflow and it's going to be a waste, which is what the world is doing. They're, they're, they're trying to, to constantly keep all of these old laws and everything that was contrary to the children of Israel back there. That's why Yahshua came in to fulfill it all and take it out of the way. You don't have to do it anymore. Doing it anymore is just, it, it's a waste of your time. Mm -hmm. It's a waste of your energy. And it's contrary to what Yahweh has told us to do. And we know he's a jealous out. Um, so standing in the holy place, <clears throat> you've got that protection too. Because if you look, and uh, it, it's hard to see, but... Um, one of the, the, the migratory pattern plate on the elementary chart shows this tabernacle in here. It's really tough to see from far away, but this is the court roundabout was all open. And the holy place and most holy place were in the center and there was a covering over them. Mm -hmm. They were covered. It was protected. Okay. So when you're in that holy place, you're protected and you're covered with that armor of Yahweh. You have everything you need here. You've got your food, your light your intercessor for Yahweh, and you're standing there with the armor of Yahweh on, knowing and holding fast to that which is good. Find that scripture for me, please. I don't know where it is. Um, the Yahweh tells us exactly what to do in the whole stand. First Thessalonians 5.21. Thank you, Kathy. I, I, I jokingly called Kathy my, my personal concordance when we had class in Buffalo. First, she knows the book. <laughs> First Thank Yahshua. Praise Yahshua. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And that is what we're doing when we're standing in the holy places. We're, all things are being proven and we're holding fast to that which is good. Look, there's no other 
Elohim other than Yahweh Elohim. And he says that, not making a golden calf. And, you know, an idol, I'm not saying, you know, you're going to throw your gold in a fire and make a golden calf. But you know what? Your job can be an idol. Money, bills, your family, your children, your husband, your car, anything that we put before Yahweh, anything is an idol. That's right. And that is where we need to be careful and cautious. We're in a spiritual, spiritual age now. The physical carnal ordinances that were given back here, for you to keep those, it's not going to do any good. Because Yahshua came in to fulfill that all, and he wrote it in your heart and in your mind. Look, when you have a kid, okay, and you go to a store and they want a pack of gum and they just take it and put it in their pocket, they're not going to go out in the car and be like, hey, I got my gum, right? And if they do, you're going to say, where'd you get that from? You didn't pay for that. We've done it. We've had to take the kid back in the store. I took this. Here's this back. And 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 the people are understanding because they're children and they're babes, right? They understand that kids know it's wrong to steal. It's written in their hearts and in their minds, but they do it anyway, right? And then you take them back in and you show them that it's wrong and you didn't do this. Now, they're not going to arrest a child usually for stealing a pack of gum, but that puts it in them and reassures that, that law that's written in your heart and mind and that you know better, you got to follow that and you've got to stick with that. Um, <clears throat> you know, the kids know, babies know, um, don't touch the stove, it's hot. What do they do? Well, what's that mean? Ow, that hurt. It burned me. They're going to touch it again? Maybe. Probably. <laughs> but they're going to think twice about it because now they know what happens, right? So... Even though it's written in our hearts and in our minds that we know right from wrong, you know it's wrong to steal. You know it's wrong to cheat, to lie, to commit murder. You know these things are wrong in your heart and in your mind. You don't have to be told. You don't have to go and, 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 and make an offering of sin sacrifice here. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. It's written in your heart and in your mind. And what does Yahweh Elohim want from us? What is life eternal? John 17 and 3, and this is life eternal. Whoa, there's a definition of life eternal. We can know it. It's right in your book. That you know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. That's your eternal life, that knowledge and understanding of your heavenly father. Without that knowledge and understanding and him showing to you and proving it to you over and over and over again every day, that's the, that's the definition of faith, too, is the proof and evidence and substance it's not just well i have faith you know because i believe in a higher power of some sort i have faith i have faith i have faith people don't understand the definition of faith you can't have faith if it hasn't been proven to you and shown to you 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 can't that's the definition of faith is mm -hmm. substance and evidence mm -hmm. and we have been proven over and over and over again look the every single day you wake up when the sun rises, you go through your day, you're dead tired, you bury yourself in your covers, you sleep, you wake up again in the morning. Every single day, you go through a death, a burial, and a resurrection. Every single day. Right. You can't deny the resurrection. You can't deny the resurrection. If you look outside here now in Buffalo, New York, or you know the, the, the Northeast, we are buried. We are buried in misery, no sunshine, snow, gloom yuck nastiness and now the the sun has come out and shine and the warm weather has brought the the, the daffodils out and the, the the spring flowers and the grass is green and the leaves are on the trees you can't deny there's a resurrection you can't deny it you can see it there's no way that you can say we're still in the death like state when you go and you look at the creation and see the resurrection birds are singing the birds are singing their song. The yeah. birds are back. They're they're waking you up and 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 singing their song and praising Yahweh always. And you know when that sunshine finally, after you haven't had the sunshine on you in a while, and you finally get out and you feel that warmth on your skin, mm -hmm. that is a praise, Yahshua. Mm -hmm. Man, it's been a long cold winter. Mm -hmm. You can't deny the resurrection. It's in our lives every day, all day, year round. Um, and standing in the holy place, knowing that and having having faith in that because of the proof and evidence that we've been given. Um, there, there's really, 
really something to be said for um, watching that pattern move and work in, in our daily lives. Um, just, a, I guess, a little bit of testimony from Chicago. Um, it, I, I, I say it all the time, and I, I'll, I, I'll say it forever. There is no love like the love of the brethren. Um, being able to have a vehicle that can get us to and fro these functions without having to rent a car now is a huge, um, huge weight off of our shoulders. Like, have car, will travel. That's less money we have to spend on a rental, you know. Car payment, yeah, but whatever. We have those anyways. Um, we were able to, you know, pack up this minivan full of all of us and head on out to Chicago and see the brethren. And it, it's like coming home. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's like going to grandma's house for, for Sunday dinner or, mm -hmm. or seeing all your family and, and friends when you're little and you're so excited to see your aunts and uncles and your cousins. And it's like uh, a, a joy that um, I, I guess you could say like a kid on Christmas, <laughs> even though it's a joke, but you know, people get, kids get all excited about that. It's something they look forward to and it's finally here. And and just looking forward to being embraced by by the brethren that we haven't seen in so long and catching up um and it's beautiful to be able to commune with the brethren and and um eat of of the spiritual food um it was it was very good to to be there um the the testimonies that we heard were um very powerful uh, there was a, an, an actual just testimony night where people got up and um, shared with the brethren things that how they know that Yahweh is is in control of their life and how Yahweh has brought them through trials and tribulations in their life. And we've all had them and we all have a story. Um, and that's that's something that's common to all all men. It's common to to all the brethren. We've all been put through some situations that we had no idea how we how we'd ever get through it and um you know, some some pretty devastating times in our lives loss and illness um and you know on some people on their deathbed and um some people just down and out in in ways that you know that we've all been um and the common thing with all the brethren is how Yahweh showed them himself and proved to them that you aren't alone, that I am in control. I am Yahweh and there is none else and how he will bring us through things. Um, and like that um, uh, quote, I guess, that um, Patty shared first, you know, it, it, that it is, it's beautiful. When we're going through the trials and tribulations that we're going through, and it seems like there's no way out, um, horrible feelings, emotions, don't know how you're going to get through it, don't know, just don't know what you're going to do. And then Yahshua says, peace be still, and he takes care of it all. And we end up getting through it, and we don't come out without a lesson, without more proof and more evidence to solidify that Yahweh really is and actually exists. Um, he's, he makes known his love and beauty and justice. And he's going to pull you out of whatever you're going through. You're not going to feel that way forever. Because of his foundation, power, and strength that we've known in this gospel, you know that that's, you know that's how Yahweh is going to be. You know that for assurance. You can take that to the bank. You know that when you're going through a really hard time right now, that Yahweh's talking to you. You got to be quiet. You got to sit down and you got to listen. All right, Yahweh, what are you trying to show me here? I'm doing something wrong. Let's get back on the right track. I need to focus on you more. See your purpose and 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 take on his wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence and allow him to prove himself to us that we can't do anything without Yahweh. When we lost our child, we were kids. Nick and I were kids. Um, 22 years old. First baby. Took off the flesh. 
We walked out of the hospital praising Yashua for allowing us to have her and allowing us to, to understand and know what philoprogenitive, philoprogenitiveness is, that instinctive love for one's offspring. Um, there's no way that we could have gotten through that without Yashua. We, you, you hear about it all the time in the world, that people divorce, people um, commit suicide, uh, they just can't handle it, just can't bear it. In the physical world, without the comfort of Yahshua the Messiah, without that light and that food and that intercessor, there's no way we can make it through these things unscathed. And what Yahshua was trying to, trying to show us and trying to teach us is that he is Yahweh. And we are, we are not our own. We're not our own. You know, as much as I've worried about our kids and, and, and suffered the loss of our first and with the three more that we have, which, you know, that's that's not coincidental. Um, you worry all the time as a parent. You know that if, if you have kids, you've had many sleepless nights just worrying and worrying and worrying all the time. Um, and, and the comfort in that is that they're Yahweh's. Mm -hmm. Yahweh has got them, just like he's got you and I. They're Yahweh's, our kids are. And we don't have to worry. We're gonna, because we can't help it. But we don't have to worry. And that's just a type and shadow of the love that Yahweh has for us. Another thing that Yahweh showed us through, um, through the loss of our child is that we are Yahweh's sons. He calls us his sons. He calls us his friends. And if it's devastating enough for someone to take their physical life when they lose a child, imagine how our Heavenly Father feels when a son is lost, when a soul is lost. Um, that's what hit home for me with the loss of our daughter. That's what I learned is that you have a soul and we need to be saved. And there's only one way that we can have that eternal life and that salvation. And that's through Yahshua the Messiah, our sovereign, <laughs> um, there's no other way we can get through this life physically, and there's no way we're going to be saved spiritually unless we know Yahshua the Messiah. And, and having that armor of this pattern and having that armor of the love of the brethren to hold each other's arms up while we're standing in this holy place is nothing to shake a stick at. It's a beautiful, precious gift, and we ought not to take that for granted. We ought to focus on Yahshua at all times. Um, and that Satan makes it hard, man. He he will do anything. Hey, over here, boo -boo, over here. Look, look at me. Look at me. You know, like like Sam was saying that that Adam needs to be that carbon needs to be the center of attention all the time. That physical needs to be the center of attention. Well, Satan wants your attention all the time. He needs to be the center of attention. He's constantly going to throw things in there and constantly try to get you to go against Yahweh. He's going to try to get you to have other idols. He's going to try to get you to worry about your checking account more than you're going to worry about getting to class. He's going to try to get you to take your eyes off Yahshua with everything he can possibly do. And that is why we need to stand in the holy place. That is why we need the armor of Yahweh, all of, all of us, always. That's why we need the love of the brethren to hold each other's arms up because this is a physical, carnal world and it is going quick. It is horrible out there. Um, we all know how bad the state and condition of this world is. Um, time is up. And uh, just keep on that armor, Yahweh, guys. Just, just know for a surety that Yahweh really is and actually exists. You have a soul to be saved. Focus on Yahshua, the Messiah. And I, I, I'm very thankful and grateful for the brethren, for this gospel, and for Yahshua just allowing us to know anything at all about our Heavenly Father, to be able to pass it on and, and to be able to focus on him to get through this world. It's an ugly place out there. We can't get caught up in it. We've got to focus on Yahshua. Keep your eye on the prize. Stand in the holy place. Hold fast to that which is good. I thank you for the time. I love you. It was great to be here with you all today. And um, I look forward to it for all of eternity, knowing, growing, and learning about Yahweh forever and eternity um, is part of that body. And um, all praise, honor, and glory go to Yahshua the Messiah. Thanks for your time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore, for your testimony. And we all rise from the doxology.
The doxology is taken from the last two verses in the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.